terrorist and extremist, these aren't just words, but they're political frameworks and methods that have been used as recently as the 21st century to funnel money into U.S. law enforcement and intelligence agencies. In terms of domestic violent extremism, domestic terrorism, uh, that number is now has grown steadily uh, on my watch. So I've, we've increased the number of domestic terrorism investigations. But there are also frameworks that have been used since before the founding of this country to suppress liberation and resistance movements led by enslaved people and indigenous people. And I think it's worth noting that both in modern and historical cases, these words and the frameworks associated with these words have always been racialized. In the early years of the war on terror, counterterrorism clearly became a tactic and a political framework used by the US government and its various agencies to criminalize and surveil Muslim communities, communities perceived to be Muslim, as well as non-Muslim, Black, Indigenous, Brown, refugee and immigrant communities. And so to bring this back to white supremacy, most recently in 2021, after the white supremacist attacks on the Capitol, we're witnessing this renewed push to refer to white supremacist attacks as domestic terrorism. And we're seeing bipartisan support to expand the war on terror apparatus to include white supremacists. But we know that the expansion of the war on terror means more funding and more resources being poured into law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And we know that regardless of who the government or the state says they're monitoring for extremism, Muslim, Black, brown, indigenous communities will bear the brunt of the surveillance and the criminalization. There is absolutely no evidence that predictive policing or that these kinds of so-called extremism prevention strategies work to reduce violence. But there is a ton of evidence that predictive policing criminalizes cultural expression, criminalizes faith practices, religious identity, mental health, and poverty. I think that true accountability for white supremacists cannot come from the same system that enables them, which is why our movements must be abolitionist and must demand total transformation of the system. This is a long-term, long-haul fight. And we can participate in this fight by engaging with political education around different community models that work to undermine white supremacist violence without relying on the police. We can work with local grassroots organizations that are working to resist the war on terror, white supremacist violence, and the criminalization of our communities. Most importantly, I think it's important to engage in joint struggle and cross-movement solidarity. I think that something that white supremacy tells us is that you know, when something bad happens, there needs to be a solution right away. When there is an act of violence, there must be an immediate way to address that violence. When addressing violence um, is actually something that takes deep commitment and relationship building and community autonomy and safety.